I did love the baseball furies. The full impact for me was when we came out of that subway station and there they all were, you know, they were visually one of my favorite gangs to look at. I think the baseball furies were probably my favorite because of the way they looked and I'm also a sports fan. The baseball furies, I wanted something that looked furious, like, you know, baseball, of course, baseball uniforms. And then I just did do different color combinations. And then along with that, it's what made them scarier. We just kind of painted their faces because Kiss was around, of course, and big. That was probably the influence there. I'm sure you remember the uh, baseball furies chasing the warriors through Central Park. We found this paved road. The problem was that there were no lights. And since we ran a good half a mile every time we made a take, any light I would have put up would have been in the picture. That's exactly what we did. I used these cheap drugstore type clip lights. And we just clip them right up into the tree branches and as the baseball furies are running, the camera is looking at them and there are all these lights in the trees. Now you're wondering why are the lights in the trees? Because I put it there. Well, Walter's approach to the movie was very different. Um, he didn't just want to make an action movie. Each fight sequence was choreographed in a different way to represent a different thing. And they weren't really supposed to be as violent as it would seem. They were choreographed to be almost like a ballet, like a dance, because he felt that in sort of a comic book sense or in the unrealistic sense of the world we were trying to create, that's the way it would look. Walter asked me with each action set piece to write the fights punch by punch so he could really get a sense of what the style was. And when I say I tried to be an extension of Walter Hill, that was an example of it. There's a kind of fun that we were trying to get into the whole thing. Somehow the baseball furies and their bats lent itself. I mean, obviously, the next step is samurai. Well, the baseball furies, that's my character's high point. I mean, he's in his element. He's just just doing his thing, and it's, it's almost like a samurai flick. And as far as the fights, Walter wanted a very sort of street fight, edgy style. And I think he had a brilliant idea. He asked me to train the cast because he didn't want to have any stunt doubles for the cast. At that time, there weren't that many good picture fight stuntmen in New York. So I basically went out and found gymnasts, um, great athletes, and basically trained them with the same style. So when the fights took place, they had a very fast, phonetic, violent pace. And I think that's what Walter was after. In uh, the case of the Baseball Furies, which I cut, Walter said to me, make it like Kurosawa, which meant that it was a lot of long lens footage, cut it quickly, but also he shot it at a lot of low angles, great, amazing lighting. I had tremendous fun cutting that scene, as much fun as any scene I've ever cut. The Baseball Furies fight, uh, you know, these guys are wearing this makeup, this, this, this cartoon clown makeup, and, you know, Ajax is, is, is kind of a prick. You know, he's got a mouth on him, and he's gonna say something, and I'm looking at him. We got baseball bats, we got these guys that look like lollipops, and bang, the, the line was born. I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. And, and I have seen that line in a magazine rated as one of the 10 best baseball lines of all time. <laughs> The action sequences in The Warriors were very stylized, very cartoonish in nature. If somebody got the crap beat out of them like we did, and all they've got is one little bruise on the side of their face, you know, in reality, nobody would be walking. Well, I, I think that I'd be very remiss if I'd say that my favorite gang wasn't The Warriors, but. Uh, I quite liked the Lizzies. I thought they were a lot of fun, and I thought that we had a lot of fun with that sequence. We said, okay, we should have a, a female gang. We should have an all-girl gang, and they should be as tough and kick the asses of the warriors and lure them into the situation which distracted them, which, you know, obviously all gang members are distracted by a pretty face. I thought the Lizzies were kind of interesting, you know, the fact that it was just an all-girl gang. They didn't have all-girl gangs back in, in 1980. It was sort of saying something about the future at that point in time. This is a chance to really have some good old American fun. I mean, you got all these cute girls, and all we've been doing is running and fighting all night long. A little break in the action. 
time to have 20 minutes of some nice stuff here. And these girls seem like they're very much willing to give what we would like to have. So it was interesting to be in that kind of situation, not knowing that they were out to do us harm like every other gang in the city, because we didn't know that. When I started to see how it was evolving with the costume design and the production design and everything else, my instinct was to keep them on par with the guys and to have women do picture fights like guys and have them taken out like guys. We took one of them out with a, with a chair. The scene with the Mercedes Rules is a wonderful actress. Uh, I didn't like the scene. I think now looking back at it, I felt very badly about the Ajax character being captured, but I didn't quite see a way out of it. I was a little bit overwhelmed because suddenly I was the only actor on set. All the other warriors had the night off. You go ahead if you want. I'm gonna get a little exercise. One of the great disappointments in the movie to the audience is the fact that the Ajax character is captured and doesn't make it all the way because he, he was quite a popular character. He was obviously a very flawed character in that he was impetuous, jealous, difficult, um, didn't respond terribly well to the crisis in leadership. But at the same time, there was a certain adventurousness and courage about the guy that uh, audiences very much responded to. Show you how I play. So it was a very violent scene. It's a, it was it was physically violent. It was sexually violent. It was emotionally violent. It, it was a very important scene, and it's a sad scene. I mean, I couldn't come back. Uh, I, I wanted very much to come back, but Ajax had to pay. It's not that the character doesn't deserve some kind of dramatic rebuke on his through line. But I think that the end that the character had is not sufficient to the grandeur of what he had been playing up to then. A warrior cannot indulge himself in, in, in sexual license. Not until, not until the time comes. And this is a part of the morality tale of this. That's why Ajax went down. And again, I think that sometimes an actor brings things to a part. James Remar is a very strong actor and he brought a lot to it that really wasn't, I think, on the page. <laughs> Fucking wimp. Can we stop for a minute? I'm sick of this crap. My legs are getting tired. Come on, just keep walking. We were working in this tunnel. One side was a solid wall in which there were rectangular openings. And through the rectangular openings, you could see into uh, the tracks that was adjoining ours. And when I looked over, I saw this train go by. I remember Deborah and I sitting in chairs, not li unlike this, you know, your director's chairs, prior to shooting that scene. And really saying to her, in the character of Swan, what I thought about her. I remember Michael asking me, something about like, what are you doing? Or are you okay? And, and I said, I, I'm just trying to feel like I'm alone. <laughs> I was just trying to identify with Mercy. And I just remember him responding with, well, don't worry, you are alone. I, I think I did that so that she would have, you know, that place to come from. <laughs> like, ooh, rude. But it was perfect, it was perfect. The train was one of the new aluminum trains, and as it went by, it was flashing, reflecting the lights. And I thought that it would be wonderful if I could somehow shine some lights into this tunnel at an angle so it would reflect back into the camera. We put the lights, we rehearsed the scene. To me, it was a tremendously wonderful moment when she pulls him over to this window and they kiss, and here comes this train with an unbelievable thunder and, and, and roar, and these lights are flickering <laughs> behind the, the two heads kissing. One of the directions that we had, which was a technical direction, was that Walter wanted us to stay lip to lip until that last train had 
past. You got guys on their little walkie talkies all the way down the line going, okay, it's coming, it's around the bend. I mean, you know, they, they have it timed perfectly, but it still seemed profound. There's a part of my head that's going, now when is this train going to get by? Because as we're kissing here and doing all this, we have to time this kind of breakaway just as the train goes by. We only had to build one set, uh, the men's room on the BMT subway. And the reason we built it uh, was because there was no men's room on the subway that would have uh, allowed us to do what we had to do in that particular set. The action scenes were really thoroughly covered. It made it a challenge to get through the material as well as it gave you a lot of opportunities to play with it. And it was fun. Fighting people wearing roller skates um, lent itself to all kinds of <laughs> possibilities, I suppose. We just tried to make it different, mix it up. That set was amazing, that bathroom. And you know, we all kind of fed once again on, on Walter's passion, and I think that slow motion can be a, a deadly device. But Walter had a real grasp of what he wanted to see in slow motion, so I really tried to design a sequence that sort of supported his vision. I think it was Walter who always had a theory about slow motion, which was to just use one angle of it in slow motion. And so we would always try and identify the one that would work the best. Actually, Walter's action sequences, I would say in all of his movies, are some of the best action sequences in movies because you always understand what happened. The encounter on the subway between Swan and Mercy and the prom couples that come in, it happens to be one of my favorite. We shot it very quickly. I think it's only got about four setups in it or something like that. We shot it in less than two or three hours. I had some doubts about it, to tell you the truth. I thought maybe it was too corny even for this film at the time. And uh, But I learned a long time ago, if you have doubts, shoot it as best you can and shoot it with whatever you can bring it. So he's accepting her and he's the first guy in her world that's actually taking her in for who she is beyond this facade that we create to protect ourselves. And so it's funny, I feel moved while I'm telling you about it because it is very rich, isn't it? This is what we fought all night to get back to. By the time we end on the subway in Coney Island, you feel everything for these kids and, and you want them something good to happen to them. And it was something that evolved better than I thought it would. Just from reading the script, I didn't think it would be that strong. But the actors and Walter really made it happen. Uh, Coney Island was probably our most difficult location because we had to shoot on the subway platform we had to get them off and that was the one time where the transit police had told us that between the subway platform and the restaurant we were eating at which was down on the street the warriors had to take their colors off because the gang in Coney Island would get offended and might do something to disrupt the shooting so we had to make sure that our guys took off their colors when they went to eat lunch so it was pretty serious and pretty you know, we didn't mess around with it. The Rogue Mobile was a big Cadillac hearse, and there were no seats in it. I think they've given me some apple boxes to sit shotgun in it. So the poor Rogue guys were kind of uh, roughing it in the back seat of the hearse, but uh, it was great. We were kind of stuck. I thought there was a moment that was not working and it just seemed a little flat. And I said to David, I said, come up with something here. It's not enough. Walter decided that he wanted a little bit more of a taunting to happen. I don't care what you do, taunt them, sing to them, and we're only gonna have about five minutes to work something out because we gotta shoot. And I went back to my chair to try to think of something, you know, that's not exactly great direction that I just gave. I lived downtown Manhattan in a kind of scary neighborhood, and there was a fellow of a kind of shady background who lived next door to me, and he would always kind of uh, threaten me or make fun of me by saying, Dave, Dave, Dave. 
it was scary. So I, I said, uh, we can use that for Luther. And out there in Coney Island, they were, at that time, they sold these little midget beer bottles. I see David run under the boardwalk, and I thought, you know, I wonder what the hell he's up to. But I knew he was up to something. So we got back in, he got back in the car, and uh, he said, let me try something like this, and he did the... Warriors come out to play. And there are certain moments where you just say to yourself, this is gold. <laughs> this is very good. And to hear those bottles rattling and, you know, David going, you know, warriors come out to play. It was like taunting and taunting. Warriors come out to play. I was a little surprised that he kept it in, but as we were doing it, I had a feeling it would be in there. Most of the crew was barely aware of what he was doing because somehow we were under the dock and we had just found some woman's purse and there was money in it and what are we supposed to do? And It was really weird when you, when you saw it in dailies and I think I extended it longer than he actually did it because I started the sound over them and then you came to him bringing the bottles up. Uh, it, was, it was real creepy. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that I dreamed up the whole thing, but I created an opportunity for something, but he did the rest. That was one of the most powerful moments in the picture, you know, when he did that. And we stayed away from him. We, nobody went around him until we actually had to get close to him on the beach. David Patrick Kelly uh, elected, as part of the way he was going to arrive at his performance, to not speak to any of the warriors, you know, and he stayed true to that throughout the whole time of filming, the only time that there was any conversation that I had with David was when we actually came to playing that final confrontation. When we see the ocean, we figure we're home. We're safe. This time you got it wrong. With Michael on the beach is the most Western moment for me. I mean, that's the big duel, the big shootout, the big mano a mano, even though one guy has got all the artillery, supposedly. But no. You're dead. Swan! You warriors are good. Real good. The best. <laughs>